reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. You know, you are one of the things that interests me that I find most puzzling in this astronomy we've been discussing is the fact that there was a beginning, the mystery of creation, because if there were no beginning, we wouldn't have to ask what happened before the beginning, and we wouldn't have to worry about who created the universe. But the fact the universe sprang into being at a definite moment seems to me uh, theological and nothing that could be answered within science. That bothered me when I first heard about it because uh, I, had, I had kind of inclined toward uh, Hoyle and Gold and Bondi's idea about continuous creation. It was something attractive about the idea that a hydrogen atom could spontaneously appear out of nowhere in a certain volume of space per certain unit time and that this would cause, cause the expansion that would allow the universe to, to break off, so to speak, at the speed of light with this recessive velocity, making the universe a kind of mysterious spring that came from we know not where and kept flowing to we know not where. That seemed attractive to me. Then when I learned that the Big Bang was much more likely, it jarred me. But then I said, well, is that any more mysterious than an infinite, eternal chain? No, that's of, right. Uh, so it, I thought either one is okay with me. The thing is that even if the universe were eternal, you'd still have to ask with Lucretius, why is there something rather than nothing? Yeah. Who put all this matter and energy in the universe? Well, and science does not answer why. It can answer how, uh, increasing, with increasing um, progress, I think. But, uh, but uh, the why becomes something that is not inside the scientific method as we know it. No, and, uh, but again, uh, no, you, can't, you can't address the question of purpose. There is no purpose to be addressed in science, but, but uh, still puzzles me the fact that um, there was a beginning and under circumstances of such heat and high temperature that there were no stars, no planets, no living things and everything in our universe happened after that beginning. It was literally a moment of creation. A very unscientific result and it suggests the presence of some forces or some things in the universe that are not within the power of scientific description. This is the basis for a theology of some sort, not involving any religious dogma, but if you have a causal chain, there always has to be a cause for any effect, and then, and then that cause becomes an effect of a cause underlying it. But in the case of the Big Bang, even science uh, tends to the view that there had to have been something, if, if there was no cause for that first effect, that calls for an uncreated creator, and, uh, and, and therefore that would be, that would answer somebody's, uh, some people's definition of a god. Well, that, that's right. Uh, suppose you try to get away from the uh, theological explanation. Is there something else that we can imagine that would uh, lay these questions to rest? Some, uh, I, I can't see it. I can't either. Neither could Stephen Hawking, really, who had, it was his no boundary principle. He did not believe that that was necessarily a god, because as soon as you use the word god, you're into religion. And that, and, uh, but the idea of an uncreated creator or a causeless cause uh, is, uh, is something that is basically theological. You know, you said that uh, one likes to lay out chains of cause and effect. But that's true in science as well. I mean, one also looks for the, for the cause for each effect. And uh, you come back to this time before which there, there's a, a blank, a curtain drops over the past. I just feel that uh, I'm an agnostic, not, not a believer, but not an atheist. I just feel that this indicates there are forces at work that, and uh, uh, entities that we don't know about. I'm sure that's true, because science is always finding out things that we hadn't known about. Think how airtight Newtonian mechanics was in its time. It really was true that if you could know the position and speed of every particle, uh, you could predict the future to eternity. That's well, right. and, and then Heisenberg came along, and that became philosophically impossible when they found out we can't know the speed and position at the same time. And that, that little, I always like the analogy of the microscope slide, that, that if you have written on one side of the microscope slide, the position of the particle, and on the other side, the speed. When you focus on the one, you, it makes the other one fuzzy. 
And you can, you can have it either way, but not both ways at the same time. So since we can't know the position and speed, that idea of predicting to eternity went out the window. And, and, and yet think how strong the Newtonian idea was in its time. So I agree with you. I think there are going to be, we're going to, there are going to be discoveries that, uh, that may, may support Plato's idea that the fact is mortal and the idea immortal. But we're not going to read about them, I think, in the Science Times or uh, Discover in our own uh, lifetimes. My guess is that those who understand these matters better and more deeply than we do are the more advanced races of the universe who are probably billions of years beyond us in their, in their science and technology. They may be kind enough to tell us, perhaps why we're still alive, but I don't think that physics is ever going to answer those questions. Yeah. What, didn't you write in one of your books that uh, when we struggle up this cliff and everything toward a truth and we finally get there, that we'll be greeted by a band of theologians who are already there? That's yes, because they, they knew there was a creator. Uh, yeah, right. And, yeah. But a uh, very strange result. And uh, from it, there also follows the age of the universe. That is, knowing that the uh, Big Bang occurred, that there was a moment of creation, we can figure out from how far apart the galaxies are today and how fast they're moving, uh, going backward in time, when they were all together, when the Big Bang occurred. And that turns out to be about 15 billion years ago, well-known number. And from that, it follows that the Earth, which is less than 5 billion years old, is a newcomer in the cosmos. So we were very proud of all our science and technology, but we're just the new kids on the block. We know almost nothing. That strongly implies that considering that length of time and the number of planets now believed to be most probably in existence at some point, that it seems extremely unlikely that we're the only game in town, even if we are the only kids on the block. Of course, we're not sure, because uh, all we know is that there's life on this planet. Yeah. It's possible that we're the only ones, scientifically possible. Yeah. But everything that has been done in the laboratory suggests that the emergence of life out of non-life is explainable by chemistry, or will be explainable. Mm -hmm. And now we know, as you were just suggesting, uh, we have reason to believe that there are planets around many stars. And there are, there are 10 million trillion stars in the visible universe. And if he, only one in 10 has planets, that's a million trillion families of planets. Now it just can't be that we are the only one among these million trillion in which life has crawled out of the muddy waters it, of the it past. It sure seems unlikely. Suppose, though, that the most complicated thing in the universe is the human brain. Now, when you th consider the organic chemistry... And well, everything. maybe someone else's brain is more complicated. Well, that's possible. But yeah. even if we are the only one, isn't it reasonable to think that maybe the universe is about the business of organizing itself and coming to understand itself with an intellect that eventually will even manipulate it in certain ways? We're already on that road you know, of manipulation. That would almost suggest a purpose that's within the purview of science. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to talk about purpose within science, but I can't resist the feeling as one contemplates uh, trillions of planets uh, and uh, assumes, uh, for which there is good reason, although no proof yet, that many, if not all, are inhabited. And one reckons that most of those planets are older than we are by billions of years, and the highest forms of life on the Earth a billion years ago were spineless invertebrate animals, worms. Uh, one wonders, now one has this picture of uh, activity on all these planets, science, technology, all the things that interest an intelligent race, and uh, the tapestry of life and activity and intelligence and technology is just overwhelmingly rich. And one wonders, how can this really be without cause, without purpose, just a random occurrence? What, what do you think? It seems to me very difficult to accept that. It, well, it might be that the whole idea of purpose is a, is a sort of a human wish. And I don't know that it's utterly necessary to find a purpose. There has to, it has to be necessary to find a reason. And science can do that. There's a reason for something. Uh, I suppose that's a cause. Um, and if you go back that causal chain again to an uncaused cause, then you're into theology again. But that's, that's not irrational. I think there's a lot about in whatever br bridge there may be between science and, and religion. I think it's reasonable to assume that, that the very thing that drives science, the curiosity of humans, is not scientific because science doesn't demand that. Uh, you know, science, science will, uh, it would be perfectly all right to say, uh, 
uh, for a human to say, why bother? You know, what difference does it make? And some humans do. There are some That's humans true. that are very, very uh, uninterested in, in science. But by and large, humanity has that curiosity and that desire to find out is a, is a property of life that uh, obviously contributes to science. But I think, I think science has its roots in that more intuitive and emotional uh, thirst for knowledge. Well, let, 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 let me suggest passing from the past to the future. Sure. Uh, as these uh, races in this picture that physics and astronomy now give us of uh, a multitude, trillions of intelligent races, as they age and become more capable, uh, they must mature or do they go on forever increasing their powers? Is there a state at some point in the future in which change has ceased and we are contemplating the end of the universe? If there is a beginning, perhaps there is also an end. Might, might a civilization that involves species like ourselves or intelligent species suffer a life cycle, a lifespan, the same way an organism does, and they may come into and go out of existence at various stages of uh, development? That's an interesting uh, thought. Uh, because even, the gen yeah. even genetic material is ultimately subject to entropy, even though it certainly seems to be anti-entropic in our case. You know, you know to tell the truth, I've been assuming that these advanced beings are not uh, flesh and blood creatures. Mm. but more akin to what we call artificial intelligence, uh, solid state, semiconductor, perhaps uh, devoid of physical presence altogether. I mean, perhaps uh, currents of electricity. Who knows? A billion years is a long time in evolution. It is. And it, in, in the idea of being contacted by them, I suppose they're very superior to us. If we try to contact a lobster, how much does he understand of our efforts to contact? Oh, Maybe right. these beings are so far above us that they're constantly screaming at us and we don't, we, we're not smart enough to realize it. Or, or, they're, or they're paying no attention to us, which is also uh, yeah, which We might be minor. I still say it's a strange picture, a picture of all these trillions of races striving, creating on their separate planets. There must be some larger meaning to this, I well, it, to me. I come back to my idea that the universe, the business of the universe is to organize itself in such a way that it comes to understand itself. And what puzzles me is it appears now that that kind of complexity can only occur in very sheltered enclaves. Uh, as far as we, when we speak of life as we know it, that means a position from a, a relatively friendly and stable star in a biosphere and where we can flourish in, in an extremely narrow range of temperature, considering the temperatures and pressures in yeah, the universe. True. We, we have to have that, we lead a very sheltered life. And uh, why would there not be that kind of complexity in the interior of big stars or something? Or That's do, an or idea sure? that I've, uh, I think Feinberg had that idea that uh, the plasma within a star might organize itself in some pattern that betokened intelligence. But all of this is possible. Uh, one might ask uh, at the same time, where does God fit into these questions? Can science prove that God exists or prove that God does not exist? What do you think? My answer to that is, that, uh, is no. It cannot, first of all, it can't prove the negative. And secondly, it can't prove the positive. And I honestly feel my, the basis of my faith is of a nature that if science came out and said, now we do have proof that God exists, I would not trust that God. I think that if, if we suddenly, it would be like a five gallon water bucket claiming that it had now captured the entire Pacific Ocean. You know, are we to believe that? And, and, and I think, and the other thing I think it has to do with the difference between subjective and objective truth. There are, uh, and, and first of all, I want to come back to this later, I don't think there is any such thing as objective truth. And I think quantum mechanics supports this. That the idea that we're an observer and, and the objective truth is out there and it's our job to discern it. I, I think whenever we set about trying to find out that objective truth, we alter what we have found and we're part of the truth that we seek, that we're seeking. But on, on the difference between subjective and objective truth, if you and I were in an argument about which state had more child abuse, Mississippi or Massachusetts, say, and you had take one, one state and I take the other one, one of us is wrong and one of us is right. Yep. And a, a certain amount, a modicum of research will prove which one is right and which one is wrong. But suppose we're in an argument about whether you prefer scuba diving to horseback riding. And I contend that you prefer scuba diving and you take the opposite view. 
What kind of research could I mount in the laboratory or the libraries that would ever disprove what you know to be true? And I think religious truths are of that latter nature. They are subjective truths, and, and, they're not, and nothing science comes up with is going to harm that. Well, that's interesting. What, what bothers me still about this is that from my studies in science, cosmology, astronomy, reading a lot of uh, Darwin, uh, I find that the, what are called the scientific explanations uh, satisfactorily account for our being here, except for the beginning. Uh, and yes. so I, I see no need for a guiding hand. <clears throat> and yet I can't imagine how this could all happen again uh, in a random way. I'm at a complete impasse yeah. and uh, looking for illumination uh, from any quarter. <laughs> well, I wonder you know, if it's, I think it is true that some religious people would, uh, would agree with that idea that the guiding hand is not there, that it's not a question of a God who's all-powerful who's going to come in and suspend physical laws to accomplish certain things, even though many sports coaches think that, that I'm always amused at coaches that pray for their team to win, because what if the other team's coach is praying at the same time? <laughs> what does God decide about what team is going to win? Uh, no, suspending those rules... The, that religious view is that, that a, a god set all this in motion and then the rest is explainable by science. But as you said, not, not the beginning. I've always been intrigued by the idea of when time began because it's generally acknowledged that the, the, big, the big Bang created not only the material universe, but time is space, uh, energy, uh, time even, came in with that. And to speak of what happened before the Big Bang is as naive to, as to say what's north of the North Pole. It, it's, it is philosophically meaningless. And therefore, if you speak of a universe that it has a beginning and an end, that is very different from a universe that in an eternity of nothingness that suddenly it comes into being and in a finite time it goes out of being some way uh, and, then, and then time goes on because time is a measure of events. If there are no events, there's no time. And uh, it's one of the things that quantum mechanics has done a great thing for us, I think. There is no T0. The singularity is a, is, is a very difficult thing not only to conceive, but it probably doesn't exist if, if quantum mechanics is correct. That any increment of a second smaller than 10 to the minus 43rd, you can imagine that, but it would be a, a, a a time shorter than time had ever developed an arrow as to as to fore and aft. With Planck time came the idea of time and was born the second law of thermodynamics and entropy and everything. Uh, because then we knew how time progressed from that point on. So there was no T0 and that kind of relates to Hawking's no boundary ideas. Uh, but it, it it isn't a matter of uh, I've even heard scientists say, you know, before the Big Bang and that's, that's a, meaningless, a meaningless thing. Well, I, I guess I'd like to uh take issue with you a little bit mm -hmm. because um, it seems to me to be meaningful to ask what came before. Uh, you say time began, or some people say time began in that moment, and that uh, very thought is difficult to reconcile with what people mean by time. And then, now let me put this to you. Uh, the astronomy tells us that in the course of time, all of the uh, primitive primordial matter of the universe, gra or much of it, gradually gets uh, gathered together into stars. And the stars burn by nuclear reactions, and eventually they burn out, become quiescent. And after a while, the action is all over. So there is an end in the astronomer's universe, just as there's a beginning. And I still submit that that's a very difficult, a very peculiar result to come out of science itself. There would be no end unless we could prove proton decay ultimately, because you might have a quiescent, you might have a black, I, mean, not, I don't even say a black dwarf in the sense of a black hole, but yeah. you might have a star that's just a cold cinder, yeah. maybe still expanding somewhat. Space would still exist because there was matter in it, mm -hmm. and time would still exist because of atomic flux. Unless that all stopped at some point, you wouldn't have an end of time. But as soon as there are no events, uh, if for any reason no matter, no space anymore, there would be no time, because time is only a measure of events. That, that's uh, true, but uh, as the stars burn out and grow uh, cold and dark, or explode, either way, eventually you come to a point where there's no more activity, no star formation, no planet formation, no energy radiated from stars. And what kind of a universe is that? Does it still support life? It would seem uh, doubtful. Life it? as we know it? And not Really not. So I, that seems to me to indicate an end.
that suggests, uh, uh, that picture suggests an end. That's the heat death. That's theory. right, that's right. Yeah. There's uh, still some energy around, but it's not in usable form, it's too dispersed. And so the question is, uh, a universe with a beginning and an end, the totality of all things in space having a beginning and an end, it just suggests that there is something larger out there looking down on all this, either arranging it or or I don't know. I don't, a game. I don't really believe that. See, I wish I could take the leap of faith, but I can't. What do you think of the idea that the missing mass will be found in the universe, that will close it, that it'll go out maybe 40, 50 billion years, and then hover for a moment and start to re-implode? Well, I think that this recapturing of eternity is just, to me, just as distasteful uh, as uh, the steady state universe. That is, yeah. uh, the fact that everything gets melted down and creation uh, begins anew to generate new ra new intelligent races and that goes on forever is to me a philosophically a very distasteful picture. Yeah. We, we had an odd, uh, it was four or five years ago and I, I think Sky and Telescope impaneled uh, myself and Carl Sagan and Tim Ferriss to uh, be judges in a, in a renaming the Big Bang contest. Yes. And we went through 14,000 uh, entries, and calling out those that didn't understand what the thing was at all, calling out a few more that were dirty, and having ultimately to call out some that were extremely clever but would never capture the public imagination and replace yeah. the term Big Bang. The feeling was that it ought to be renamed because it, the origin of the universe was neither big or was it a bang? <laughs> so, so it's a complete misnomer. But we finally con concluded in somewhat the same way that a comedian once said that the girls in his hometown were so homely that they had a beauty contest one time and nobody won, that it, he, we decided that we ought to declare no winners and leave the name Big Bang, because that's what it's going to be called from now on. Uh, yeah. But it is so different from what it, when I think of the Big Bang, I think of myself out here seeing this thing start from nothing in big explosion. Well, there was no out there. There was no observer. It, 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 it started matter, energy, um, uh, you know, mass, time. Well, how do you know there was no observer? You know, you were... Well, if it, because if it started in an already existing space, then it wouldn't have been the kind of creation that we are thinking of, you know, in other well, words... We are, you know, there's the question of scale. Yeah. Our universe could be a, a radioactive uh, atom in someone else's world. I suppose. But there's something about this... Uh, but uh, the fact that science leads us to a, a, a universe with a beginning and an end just suggests that uh, there's more to this story than we know, than science knows today. Well, the very fact that that, the very fact that you're agnostic and that you wonder about that, there's where the roots of religion lies and the curiosity of humans to try to find out. And, and when they speak of faith, I'm not talking about, you've got to subtract the faith that comes from a lot of dogmatic religions that brings people in who are fearful for themselves. They, have, they need a sense of security. And that, that, that's hope, and hope is different from, from faith. Uh, faith would be better defined, I suppose, by a flourishing of that curiosity and a deep growing belief that the universe is not really ultimately hostile. We speak of how hostile the universe is because the temperatures are so enormous, the distance is so overwhelming, and we're, we're so suffocated with humility when we contemplate it. Uh, but the older one gets, if one is of a religious nature, the more one tends to feel that the universe is not only not hostile, but probably in the long haul will somehow take care of us. And, and that's not scientific. But, but it has to do with what, with what religion well, is made of. It's, it's religious, yes, that's right. I, I, again, my mind goes back to that tapestry of, of life in the universe. Trillions of planets with creatures like ourselves, each one believes himself and herself to be at the summit of creation, and yet each of these intelligent races is absolutely uh, negligible in its uh, contribution to the, the whole. And one wonders whether this can just happen in a funny way by the laws of random collisions and mutations and natural selection. Just uh, doesn't seem right. It, it, what do you think about the idea that there might be, I, Freeman Dyson, I guess, came up with this idea that there might be civilizations so sophisticated that they harness the whole energy of their parent star or maybe a galaxy somewhere. And maybe that takes 10 billion years and that's why... Uh, okay, but even that will run out. Even that will run out eventually. And 
Now, does uh, another universe start up somewhere else? Well, what about baby or universes? Is and, there nothing before and nothing after? That's peculiar. Is it possible that we're just one universe that could that, that uh, could be spawned? I, I remember when Hawking talked about baby universes. You know that uh, if you get a certain condition, enough of a warp in the uh, uh, in, in the space-time continuum, and if that uh, ran, that flux, of the false vacuum, uh, is true, and that somebody once said there's enough energy in a cubic meter of empty space to boil all the oceans in the world, I don't know if that's true, but I heard that it was Steven Weinberg or somebody said. Said that, then then you've got an enormous energy component to the universe. Oh, you mean the vacuum uh, energy? The, the vacuum energy, I yes. Uh, that, yeah. the, that that would, uh, if that was true, I don't know whether that'll ever turn out to be proven, but that would that would do mean something for both space travel and sidereal engineering and various things like that. Uh, there may be things out there that we have yet to find out about that will greatly change our current view of the universe. But don't, don't you find uh, the, uh, these remarks by the cosmologists and the uh, particle physicists, physicists to be somewhat uh, unsatisfying because they're not rooted in uh, ordinary experience. They're very formal concepts. It's true, but some... Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, go ahead. Well, I was, I was just thinking that it, that sometimes leads to a theological view and somewhere, and I'd like to track this because I read it somewhere, that Einstein once said that uh, it, it led to a kind of a theological view and showed the naivete of our thinking of, of material stuff as solid in the way that Dr. Samuel Johnson said, I know that rock is solid and real because I kick... I kick it and it hurts my foot, you know, right. as though that was a, a, an explanation. But Einstein is suppo supposed to have said that, he said, once we thought the electron was a little tiny hard ball that had an electric charge around, negative electric charge. So then we found out it wasn't a tiny hard ball, but it was a, it was a, a space that, that had the electric charge around it. That the electric charge was a warp in a space-time continuum. That the warp was pure geometry. And pure geometry is pure mathematics. And pure mathematics is pure thought. And he said, we're created in God's image because we think. <laughs> and that was sort of theology for Einstein, it seems like. <laughs> Even though I'm sure he, he, he would not have fit or embraced any dogmatic uh, religion. No, he, he, he saw religion or saw the existence of God in the laws of physics, as, as you just implied. And, uh, but he was a special person. But um, to get back to God... Um, we talked a little bit about the question, can science prove that God exists or prove that God does not exist? It seems to me that the story gets along perfectly well without God in all its details. How the earth formed, how life arose on the earth, how man evolved, all of that um, is explainable in a very satisfying way. Uh, does that prove that God does not exist? The uh, trouble with drawing that conclusion is that when you step back to look at the whole picture, you run up against this problem of the beginning and the end again. Yeah. Now, the fact that science can't make any comment on that issue, does that prove that God does exist? Where, where are we in this? It matters so much to so many people. I think it leaves the issue open, and that's why the, the most honest religious people are agnostic. Not atheistic, because atheism is a dogmatic religion. It really is. It's, uh, it, it demands, uh, to be an atheist, you've got to say absolutely there can be no God. And I think that's an untenable position, and a rather unscientific position. That's right. It, it's a statement based on faith, uh, but not on the evidence. A very basic question in all of what we are discussing is whether there exists some kind of a bridge between the scientific method, which is a product of, of, of human logical thinking, and, the, and a spiritual dimension, which is something that we can't make go away by, uh, by just saying science is kind of, uh, doesn't have the answers. You know? So, so is, there, is there a link there? It, it does, uh, we've established, I think, that science has its roots in that very thing, in a kind of a, uh, a spiritual element that causes the curiosity we have to, to do science. Uh, I guess I would go to the mat with you on that last statement, I, just to pick up on that, because uh, as a uh, dedicated Darwinian, I believe that uh, the explanation for our sense of curiosity is not in something outside us or something that might be called spiritual, but simply in the fact that the curious entity, curious individual, is more likely to stumble across new for sources of food, uh, enter new territories, 
really what, for example, uh, led the Asians of a long time ago to uh, leave the Asian mainland and sail across the Pacific Ocean in canoes to uh, later found the beginnings of Polynesia. Uh, what could it be but curiosity? The same curiosity that makes the cat push open the cabinet door. No uh, prospect of material gain, just curiosity to see what's there. But you think that has a survival value? That, yes, that because uh, indeed they found territory that they could, uh, very rich territory that they could farm. Okay, that's, that's, that, I agree with that, but I don't think that's everything that has uh, to do with it, because I think, I think there's a, a desire <clears throat> to find things out is, it, it doesn't square with the idea of, of a life cycle of the, of the individual. You know, we, we are always told that when you get to a point after you're of reproductive age, nature kind of turns her back on you and doesn't really care about the arthritis and, and other things because you've done what nature wanted you to do and that's the end. Uh, many life uh, forms uh, go to seed at the end of their life cycle, the individual organism. A dandelion uh, blossoms and then goes to seed and dies. A salmon swims upstream, sw spawns and dies. Humans go to seed at about age 13 to 15 and then can live to be 100. And we, we are coasting, I grant, it's, but, but there's an enormous amount of activity among which is pursuit of scientific truth that goes on there. Even knowing the organism itself is not going to survive. I, I don't know, does that, in your mind, does that just, is that just survival value that, uh, that causes the, uh, the scientific curiosity? I think that curiosity has survival value and, uh, there, and is therefore very strong in us for that reason and in some other animals as well. Yeah. And uh, see no need to look outside the body of science for the explanation, although I'm not saying it doesn't, that it's uh, wrong to do so. It seems to me that uh, this question is related to the question of reductionism. Uh, are we more, is there more to us than the atoms and molecules that make us up? And there, uh, if you believe that uh, there is, uh, you are a religious person. Mm. If you find that the story yielded by biochemistry and by uh, natural selection is sufficient to explain everything, then uh, you really have put yourself down on the side of atheism. Mm. If you don't know what the answer is, then you are an agnostic. Unfortunately, I find the scientific story so satisfactory that my inclination is to be a person of faith or an agnostic, but my uh, knowledge uh, keeps driving me into that other camp of atheism, uh, from which I retreat because I think it is uh, arrogant and presumptuous. Yeah. to assume that you know that God does not exist. Yeah. I don't know, I'm in a quandary. Don't know what to say. Would you accept the idea that there might be, there might be truths that are extra logical but not illogical and there's a difference because the old concept of a miracle was something that demanded. I, my brother Wally, whom you know, had a wonderful discussion one time with a guy from the, a very religious man from the American Southwest who talked about a miracle of bells that rang in this old mission uh, church and, and the, um, it was a miracle that they rang and my brother said, uh, said, well why was it a miracle? He said because the bells were broken. They, they were they were broken and rusted shut and they couldn't ring. And my brother said, well then, was that maybe, did everybody hear it? And he said, yes. He said, well then, can you, could a mass hallucination have caused that? He said, no, no, if it was a mass hallucination, it wouldn't be the miracle. And finally the argument boiled down to, in order to be a miracle, he had to believe that the bells were broken and broken meant incapable of ringing but they rang. So you see the, the paradox, it's uh, illogical. And most miracles are of that nature. And that's illogical. But there are extra logical things, I think, in uh, extra logical truths that might be pursued, which do, do no violation to logic, but that might fall outside the realm of what we now call the scientific method. And, and that, that is a, a form of dualism that you're expressing. Yeah, I think so. It is, it is a form of dualism. Well, uh, these subjects, I suspect, are not going to be uh, answered, illuminated in our lifetime or possibly even in the lifetime of our species. It's too bad. I just, hope that you and I would have the answer right <laughs> here. We I, haven't done that Except for yet. one possibility, which is to, uh, to close, I would say that there may be uh, creatures in the world 
that have traveled, traveled this path before us and know the answers and know what's at the end of the road. And they may be kind enough to drop in for a visit sometime and tell us what's going on. And I, that's something I would look forward to. Good.